recorded live at Consciousness Evolution, sponsored by the Marion Foundation, held March 25th and 26th, 1995, in Marion, Massachusetts. Tape number MFE 11, The Outsider's View of Consciousness, with Colin Wilson. When The Outsider came out in 1956, I gave a lecture to the Shaw Society in London and suddenly found myself saying, out of the blue, that I believed that man was on the point of an evolutionary leap to a new phase. I hadn't really thought about this. It just came out in the course of talking. Since then, this has become a deeper and deeper conviction until over the past two or three years, what I've recognized is that there is a sense in which we have already taken the evolutionary leap. It's merely a matter of suddenly realizing what has happened. When I was listening to Peter this morning, I found that things he was saying kept triggering things in me, and I kept staring out of the window, and without ceasing to listen to him, found my mind going off in other directions, in uh, that have been inspired by what he said. Now, this in itself strikes me as a, a very curious and interesting thing. Uh, six months ago, I was driving back with my children from Torquay in Devon. I was talking to them about some ideas that had occurred to me. And I noticed that I was driving fairly well and carefully. And it suddenly struck me that my mind was moving on two completely different levels. It is true that you can drive kind of robotically, mechanically. We all have a kind of robot inside us which does things for us. Um, you learn French painfully word by word and then the wo robot takes it over and talks it for you. You learn to drive a car, the robot drives the car for you. And you can even, if you're very tired, get home and not even remember driving home. Um, the robot has driven you all the way home. <laughs> the, the problem with the robot is that he not only does the things we want him to do, like talking French and driving the car, he does the things we don't want him to do, um, like <laughs> listening to music, enjoying poetry. You go for a lovely country walk. The first time, it moves you deeply. The tenth time, the robot is walking instead of you. This is what tends to cut out reality from us. I say, I've even caught him making love to my wife. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> but on this occasion, driving along with the children, definitely... Um, I was driving the car, I was, I was noticing things, I was driving fairly carefully, and so it wasn't the robot driving, I was driving, and yet I was at the same time talking and noticing that I was doing something on two completely different levels. And this got me quite interested and excited, and when I got home, I put it down on tape, and then forgot about it totally. Until about three weeks ago, when once again we happened to be driving back from Torquay, I suddenly thought I had a very important insight last time coming from Torquay, when I got home, searched through my tapes, dug it out, and suddenly remembered. This is always happening to me. The insight comes and then, because other things overlay it, gets forgotten. Now, in this particular case, it seemed to be very important because although before I got home I'd remembered the insight about the two streams, the two levels of consciousness, what I had not recognized is why I thought it so important. Now I began to remember. Years ago, I was driving down from the Lake District back to Blackpool in someone else's car. And my car at that time did not have a radio, and his did. And I was feeling very tired. And then feeling absolutely exhausted and just thinking, God, wouldn't I be glad to be back at the house and open a bottle of wine? And then, as this was going on, I switched on the radio. And it was some absolutely boring, I think it was an admiral talking about the requirements for the Navy which didn't interest me in the least. But I found that just focusing upon the Admiral quite suddenly left me feeling completely relaxed and fine. So that long before we got back into Blackpool, I was feeling refreshed. Now, this interested me very much. Clearly what had happened is that I had focused and funneled my attention. And that as soon as that happened, I went into this rather cheerful state with energy flowing back in. This is what it's all about, funneling. 
Um, Janet, the psychologist who seems to be far greater than Freud or Jung, um, said that the mind is a kind of funnel of tension. He also um, used this phrase, which seems to me of tremendous important, importance, the reality function, our ability to get back into touch with reality um, when trying to deal with it in terms of abstractions, which is, of course, the best way to deal with it, has nevertheless left us feeling rather confused. This notion of the funnel of tension, which is what happens when you switch on the reality function, this is obviously what happened to me when I was driving. You know how you can be feeling um, sick, and suddenly you think about something that interests you, and you stop feeling sick instantly? Well, that's because our minds were intended to work upon two levels, parallel. There was, it was intended to go in two streams. When the two streams get mixed together, as they do an enormous amount of the time, particularly when you're feeling tired, your mind gets mixed up with your body. Something interests you, and suddenly the two streams separate, and you cease to feel sick instantaneously. Rudolf Steiner once said that the interesting thing about human beings is that their inner world is the spirit world. That if you want to know about the spirit, just settle down and study geometry. <laughs> You're moving immediately into the spirit world. <laughs> which, sounds <laughs> <laughs> which sounds completely absurd because we don't think about geometry as having anything to do with the spirit. But in point of fact, Steiner had once again recognized this curious business of the two streams. And that the moment you divert your attention fully and totally inside you, suddenly you're in the second stream. You know, the Zen master Ikkyu was asked to write something on a tablet by a workman, and he wrote, attention. And the workman said, oh, come on, write me something significant. And so he wrote, attention, attention. <laughs> and the, work the workman said, oh, come on. And Ikkyu wrote, attention, attention, attention. And the workman said, what does attention mean? And he said, attention means attention. <laughs> Funnel, that total funneling. This is somehow the basic answer. As soon as we go into total funneling, we move up into the second stream. Now, I was always fascinated, as you know, by Abraham Maslow. Uh, Maslow wrote to me in about 1958, explaining that he'd got sick of studying sick people because sick people talked about nothing but their sickness. And he decided he would study the healthiest people he could find. So what he did was ask around among his friends and say, who's the healthiest person you know? And he quickly got together a group of extremely healthy people. And they were, they were mostly sort of cheerful people with plenty to do and so on. But what he found out was something that nobody had ever found out before, that all these healthy people had several times a day what he called peak experiences, these experiences of bubbling, overwhelming happiness. He said they weren't mystical experiences. He said there was young mother watching her husband and children eating breakfast, when a beam of sunlight came in through the window, and she suddenly thought, my God, aren't I lucky, and went into the peak experience. And the point was, of course, she was lucky before the beam of sunlight came in through the window, but she was not aware of it. We are all lucky all the time, as Peter was saying, and we are not aware of it. All that happens is that you turn your mind in that direction. Maslow found that when he began to talk to his students about peak experiences, they began remembering peak experiences they'd had in the past and more or less just dismissed and forgotten about. Uh, uh, for example, one of them was a jazz drummer um, working his way through college, and he said that one morning, at about two o'clock in the morning, he'd been drumming so perfectly he just couldn't do a thing wrong, and he went into the peak experience. William James, you know, similarly says that a footballer could be playing the game perfectly for years technically perfectly, and then suddenly one day something happens and the game plays him. And again, he can't do a thing wrong. And in some weird way, you rise up to a higher stage. Now Maslow, as you know, also went on to formulate this notion of the hierarchy of needs or values. And what Maslow said was that if you're starving to death, then you think that if you could just have one good meal a day, you'd be ideally and ecstatically happy. In point of fact, of course, if you well-fed, the next level emerges, which is the need for a roof over your head, domestic security, and so on. And again, every tramp dreams of a country cottage with roses around the door. He imagines that he'd be perfectly happy. In fact, if that level emerges, then uh, if that level is satisfied, the next level emerges, which is the need for sort of sex and love. Um, not, not just uh, sex, but actually the need to, to give and, and be loved and wanted and so on. Now, if that level is also satisfied, the next level emerges, which is the need for self-esteem, the need to have people respect you, like you, look up to you. 
And Maslow said that if that level also is satisfied, in some people, but not in all, a fifth level emerges, which he called self-actualization. Now, self-actualization is not necessarily anything to do with Beethoven writing the Ninth Symphony. Self-actualization is simply, something, simply doing something well, that you really do well. And Maslow talked about a mother who was such a good mother that when her kids grew up, she began to adopt other children. But also, he said, one man, one self-actualizer he met, simply put ships in bottles. And he, he was just good at it. Now, think of it. Putting a ship in a bottle, you are funneling your energies totally and completely. Self-actualization is basically funneling. And when you funnel... You go up into the second stream. This is the most interesting thing. Now, Maslow found that his students, when they talked to one another about their peak experiences, began having peak experiences all the time. I once said to Maslow, um, how, do you, how do you get peak experiences? Uh, what's the basic mechanism? And Maslow said, there's no way of getting peak experiences. It doesn't seem to work if you try to get them. He said, um, basically, as soon as you turn your mind in that direction, the peak ex experience escapes. It tends to come out of the blue. Now, this, of course, was a restatement of the 19th century, of the poets, the artists, and so on, who had these wonderful ecstatic experiences in which everything seemed wonderful. Think of Van Gogh's painting, The Starry Night, in which the sky seems to explode into clouds of vitality, and the trees are like green flames going towards it. And yet, two years later, Van Gogh shot himself in the stomach, leaving behind a note saying, misery will never end. And for me, the fundamental question was, which is true, the suicide note or the starry night? This was the question that lay behind my book, The Outsider. I thought there must be a way of answering this. Our human states of consciousness change from moment to moment. So that I once said that trying to grasp your states of consciousness and understand them and control them is a bit like Alice you know, trying to play croquet with one of those birds that keeps twisting its neck around. <laughs> but it clearly can be done, and Maslow thought it couldn't. And I pointed this out to him, that he's basically optimistic philosophy. What he was saying was that Freud and other modern psychologists had simply underrated and undersold human nature. And he talked about what he called higher ceilings of human nature. And don't forget, this was back in the 50s. It's a long time ago when he got these ideas and when nobody in the American Psychological Association took this kind of thing seriously at all. Um, they were all either stimulus response people or Freudians. Now, it did seem to me that although Maslow thought that peak experiences couldn't be achieved at will, he was clearly mistaken because the, his students had begun to achieve them by talking to one another about them. You turn your mind in that direction, and you begin to achieve them. Secondly, you can also notice certain things about peak experiences. That, for example, you can get quite happy and excited, and up you go to this second level. It's to do with the second stream. Now, all psychology so far has tended to assume that consciousness is a product of the brain, or that at any rate, there's no really close connection between them, as um, Descartes thought. Now, in point of fact, as soon as you really focus upon this problem, you see that if you can concentrate consciousness simply by focusing intently, then clearly there is some extent to which you can control consciousness. This is what fascinated me from the beginning. What I wanted to know was, how can we have peak experiences at will? And Maslow had given me the first important clue. First of all, you turn your mind in that direction. You get it away um, from a tendency to think gloomily and pessimistically. Because once again, as Peter said, the, the main problem um, is our ideas and thoughts about the future and so on. I love this story about the man who goes to borrow the lawnmower from his next-door neighbor. And on his way there, he thinks, I know what's going to happen. The next-door neighbor is going to say, why don't you buy your own lawnmower? And I'm going to say, well, it's not really worth buying a lawnmower. And the last one broke down and so on and so forth. By the time he gets and knocks on his neighbor's door, he shouts, keep your bloody lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> so this is the basic problem, to sort of start involving our minds in all these problems about the future and simply getting tangled up. Now, one thing was absolutely obvious to me, and here's where anybody who's ever heard me knows exactly what I'm going to say next. Um, Graham Greene, as you know, tried to commit suicide once by playing Russian roulette. Um, he was absolutely fed up um, as a child, as a teenager, with his school, went into a state of total misery and boredom in which he saw everything as grey and dull. He said he would look at a scene which he could see visually was beautiful, but he would feel nothing whatever, just dead inside. That he discovered in the cupboard a revolver belonging to his elder brother, took it out on a Berkhamsted common and played Russian roulette. He put the revolver to his head, cocked it, spun the chamber and pulled the trigger. And when there was just a click, he looked down the barrel and the one bullet had come into position. So he'd missed death by just one. He said he felt an overwhelming feeling of sheer happiness. He said, <laughs> it was as if a light had been turned on and suddenly I saw the whole of the universe is absolutely wonderful. Now, the wording there is very interesting because if you go into a dark room and you turn the light on, what you see is what was in the room before you turned the light on, but it was there already. And clearly the implication is that what Green saw when he pulled the trigger was already there. And, in fact, Green could not maintain this and tended to sink to a lower level. And he did this six times in all. And by the sixth time, um, in fact, he'd ceased to get any kick out of it, so he gave it up. <laughs> <laughs> Which often seems to me a pity, because I detest his work absolutely and totally. <laughs> <laughs> Now, clearly, you can see that Green had seen some kind of mechanism. Just think of it. Um, his feeling sort of... Ugh. Then he points the gun at his head. He pulls the trigger. His whole being goes... Aah! And then there's a click, and he goes... Whew. So you can see the basic mechanism of the peak experience is... Whew. Like this. Now, it's quickly struck me that, in fact, this is a real mechanism. Um, De Quincey had once said to Wordsworth, how do you get these poetic experiences? And Wordsworth said, oh, I don't know, I can't explain. And they went on to meet the cart that was coming from Keswick with the mail. And Wordsworth got down and put his ear against the ground to listen for the rumbling of the cart. When he couldn't hear anything, he straightened up and saw a star in the sky which struck him as incredibly beautiful. And he said to De Quincey, now I can tell you, whenever my attention is totally focused on something that has nothing to do with poetry, then I relax. Whatever I see appears to be extremely beautiful. So it's clearly a mechanism. Now, I quickly developed that into a sort of exercise. What I actually did, any, anybody can do this. Um, you take out of a pen and you hold it up against a blank wall or the ceiling, and then you concentrate. You give it everything you've got. You really concentrate until you're red in the face and you see nothing but the pen suspended in time. Then you relax. Now, if you've done that properly, as you relax, it should sort of hurt a little bit, like squeezing your muscles too tight. And then do it again a second time. And each time you do it, concentrate. Give it everything you've got. And so as you relax, you actually feel that you're hurting something inside you slightly. Now, when you've done it about ten times, you'll find that it really becomes painful behind the eyes. And when it reaches that stage, keep going. <laughs> because the next two or three times suddenly send you into the peak experience. It always works. It, uh, so, <laughs> in my... Um, in, In my workshops, I'd, you know, ha have this habit. I also discovered a very interesting thing. When I was writing a book about Wilhelm Reich, I talked to a student of Reich's called Constance Ruth Tracy, who said to me, did I know about Reichian breathing? And I said, no. So she said, well, lie down. So I lay on the floor, and she said, now, take in a deep breath, and feel as you're breathing in, that you're breathing in orgone energy, vital energy from around you. She said, now, hold it. And when you've got it in your chest, as you release your breath, try and... 
hold the orgone energy and you push it down through your body. And as you do so, you say, out, down, through. Out from the lungs, down through the solar plexus, then through the genitals and down towards the feet. Now, I found that this was a marvelous method of getting students relaxed. But one day, and this was um, 14 years ago, in Finland, I'd got a group of people at about half past midday when lunch was at one o'clock doing Reiki and breathing. I'd already showed them what I call the pen trick, and an idea occurred to me. I said, look, let's try combining Reiki and breathing with the pen trick. <laughs> now, in theory, this should not work at all, simply because the Reiki and breathing obviously involves relaxation, whereas the pen trick involves deep concentration, attention. In point of fact, when they breathe in deeply, they concentrated on the pen. And then as they said, out, down, through, we all relaxed and saw the wall, so to speak, behind the pen. And I quickly found, I'd already been sort of doing exercises for about half an hour before this, so we were all a little tired. I quickly found that what this did was to send you into the most delicious state of relaxation. I was relaxing much more deeply than normal. And, you know, when you get tired, you put the pen down on the ground and a few minutes and then raise it again and start all over again. I suddenly looked at my watch and it was half past one. We'd just been lying there in this sort of state of blissful ecstasy. And I realized suddenly that this is an extremely interesting basic exercise. Somehow you've broken through to some deeper level of drive inside you. Now, this business about the two streams is extremely interesting. The psychologist Wilder Penfield, um, who, as you know, was deeply interested in the mechanisms of the brain, believed fundamentally, as most psychologists did in the 1930s, and that consciousness is a product of the brain in the way that heat and light are products of a fire. One day, um, he was prodding around in the temporal cortex of somebody's brain um, with a sort of electric probe, because um, the brain has no nerves, and so brain operations are, can be done with the, with the patient wide awake. And suddenly the patient said, my God. And he said, what is it? And the patient explained that as the temporal uh, cortex had been stimulated by the probe, he had suddenly gone back with tremendous reality to a particular day when he was 10 years old, and there he was in the kitchen, and everything in the kitchen was exactly and precisely as it had been. He could hear the voices outside in the yard. In fact, the experience had been reduplicated for him with great precision. Now, as Penfield went on doing this, he suddenly realized that there was something very odd about this, because the patient was sitting there talking to him, fully aware of him and fully aware of the room around them, and yet he was living in the past. He was in two places at once. Suddenly, Penfield realized that consciousness cannot be a product of the brain because it, it has two streams. Um, it's, it's like imagining that the, if you've got one of those single taps out of which water comes when you turn the hot and cold water on, that there's only, you know, just hot and cold, and then suddenly realizing in a house with two taps that, in fact, you've got really literally two different streams. This is what was recognized by Penfield, and this is what, in a sense, was recognized by Steiner, and also by Maslow. And what's more, the odd thing is that as soon as we go into this second stream, we experience a curious feeling of sheer bliss and happiness, which is basically merely due to the fact that you've gone into the self-actualizing mode, you're focusing. Self-actualizing, like the chap putting ships in bottles, is simply paying total attention, focusing. As soon as all your energies are poured into that funnel of tension, you cease to leak. This is the problem with ordinary consciousness. We go around leaking like people who've slashed their wrists and are bleeding. Ordinary consciousness is appallingly wasteful. And half of it wastes by running away inside you, like leaving the bathroom tap running and letting the water go away down the hole. That's why the moment you focus and concentrate, something interests you, you feel better. You instantly go into the second stream. It seems to me that in a certain sense, this notion of the second stream is one of the most important ideas I've ever had, one of the most important unifying insights. 
Now, there's another interesting business connected with this. I used to have a great admiration for a novelist called Margaret Lane. Uh, Margaret had given up writing for several years, and when I met her for the first time, I said, why did you stop writing novels? And she told me this very interesting story. Uh, she said that she'd had a baby, and she was feeling absolutely, totally exhausted after the birth. Um, it had taken everything she'd got, but she was ecstatically happy. She said, the only trouble with this state of immense happiness was that if anything went wrong, it struck her as a major problem. For example, the cat trapped its foot in the door, and this struck her as a tragedy. She was feeling for the cat in this state of total exhaustion. She said, now, she was in that state when she read that copy of The New Yorker with John Hersey's account of the dropping of the atom bomb on Hiroshima. Do you remember when they devoted a whole issue of The New Yorker to this? And she said this was so appalling that it simply blew her emotional fuses. She said that she could not believe, you know, that human beings could do something like this to one another. And that from then on, she suddenly, like Graham Greene, stopped feeling. She went totally dead inside. And she said she continued to be a good wife and a good mother, but she felt nothing whatever. It was as if she'd burned out her inner fuses. Oh, she said that one of the characteristics of this state was that leaves on trees looked as if they were sliced out of green tin, and the grass looked as if it had been sliced out of blue paper, which is apparently one of the signs of paranoia. <laughs> anyway, she said that she continued to struggle on. One day, she and her husband went along to look at a cottage, a country cottage they were thinking of buying. And she said as they were walking up the garden, the grass, as usual, looked like blue paper and the leaves looked like green tin. But, and she was feeling it cheerful, you know, because you would if you're thinking of buying a nice little country cottage. She was feeling at a slightly higher level than usual, but still basically rather dead inside. And then suddenly she noticed the bluebell, the first one she'd noticed that year in the grass. And she stopped to stare at the bluebell, and she said as she stared at the bluebell, suddenly something happened. And it broke inside her. She said it was like the ice breaking on a river in spring. And she burst into floods of tears as she suddenly realized that a three-year emotional freeze-up was over. The grass suddenly looked like normal grass. The leaves suddenly looked like normal leaves. And she said it didn't go away instantly. You know, it took the next week or so. But gradually, it just disappeared completely. And she was back in her normal state. Now, here's the interesting question. Graham Greene got into this state in which he felt completely dead inside, played Russian roulette and experienced what Margaret Lane experienced looking at the blue flower. And you can see why. Margaret Lane looked at the blue flower, and all she did was pay total attention. She said, ooh, blue flower. All her attention went down the funnel of tension, and suddenly it did something inside her and broke this blockage. Now, why did Graham Greene keep having to do it six times over, and even after that? remained a sort of miserable little bastard for the rest of his life. <laughs> Why did Green revert to the previous stage and Margaret Lane pull out of it once and for all? This, for me, was an extremely interesting question. Even more so because Ramakrishna had also achieved his first glimpse of Samadhi when in a state of total misery because the Divine Mother hadn't revealed herself to him, he seized a sword and was about to drive it through himself when he said suddenly the Divine Mother revealed herself in tremendous waves of light that came bursting over him and knocked him unconscious. But from then on, whenever someone simply mentioned the name of Kali, he immediately went into Samadhi. He'd somehow got the solution. Again, it remained a permanent thing. And he clearly done it in the same way as Graham Greene, about being a, to drive a sword through yourself, the same as playing Russian, Russian roulette, in a sense. Now, it struck me that the answer is interesting. The human mind, you might say, is shaped like a flight of steep steps. And the reason it's shaped like a flight of steep steps is you can't go down very easily. Even if you're feeling rotten and miserable, you may roll down one step, but you don't roll down the whole flight to the bottom. Or a different analogy, you know that um, inside the atom, the electrons are revolve around the nucleus in a series of rings like planets around the sun. Now, what happens is the electrons can actually jump from one orbit to another, but you have to give them so many packets of energy called quanta. And if you give the electron, let's say, 11 packets of energy, nothing happens. It stays in the same orbit, going at the same speed. You add the 12th packet, 
and quite suddenly it leaps and reappears in the next orbit outwards. But in the same way, if you want to make the electron go inwards, take away 11 packets and nothing happens. Take away the 12th packet and suddenly in it goes. Now, I think that in the case of Margaret Lane, she was basically a cheerful sort of person, and like Maslow self-actualizers, who was, were often sort of mothers with families and this kind of thing, the fact that you know, she had something purposeful she felt to do meant that, in a sense, she'd added quite a number of quanta to the electron. And that business of going to the cottage added the 11th quantum, and the blue flower added the 12th quantum, and up she went to the next level. Whereas Graham Greene did this convulsively, now he could have stayed on the next level if he'd understood what happened. If he'd said, if it was like a light being turned on, what I saw in that room must have been true. Now, unfortunately, Greene did not have this attitude. There's a, an interesting story by Thomas Mann called Disillusionment, in which a man sitting on a bench in St. Mark's Square in Venice gets into conversation with the next man on the bench, and the man says, have you ever known what it is to feel total miserable disillusionment. He said, it's been happening to me all my life. When I was a child, all of the things I really looked forward to when I got them turned out to be a disappointment. He said, once we were even burned out of our house and I stood there on the lawn looking at the house going up in flames thinking, so this is what it's like to be burned out of house and home. You know, how boring. He said, later in life, um, I fell in love, the girl was unfaithful to me, I was tormented by jealousy. And I thought, so this is what it's like to be tormented by jealousy. How boring. He said, I saw the sea for the first time. I thought, so that's what the sea is. How boring. He said, and this has gone on all through my life. He said, I don't know why I'm bothering to still live because I know it's going to be like this for the rest of my life. Everything is going to be boring. This was a, a very early story by Thomas Mann. And as you know, Mann took this same rather negative view of human existence. That is, he thought that the people who um, could enjoy life, what Maslow was called, would call peakers, were people who were stupid enough to be able to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that highly intelligent people, um, because they were highly intelligent and therefore self-analytical and all the rest of it, tended to cause their own energies to leak away. And that, therefore, you could either be intelligent and miserable or stupid and happy, but there was no in-between. <laughs> And this is the formula we get again and again in Thomas Mann's work. Now, this, in a sense, you can see, looks terribly plausible. Because, particularly when uh, we don't have very much to do, very often we tend to go into the neutral mode. And when you're in the neutral mode, you tend to wonder what to do with your life and so on, or what you ought to do next. And once this happens, it's terribly easy to simply let yourself go. And of course, people who stay in the neutral mode for long, long times, um, people like some of the outsiders I quote in my book, um, people like Sartre Rockentin in his novel Nausea, um, spending too much time alone simply go into the neutral mode until they're on the edge of the step, ready to fall down to a lower level. And this is what happened throughout the 19th century. That's why there was such an enormously high rate of suicides, um, deaths by stupid things like tuberculosis, or even stupid accidents like Shelley's drowning. These people had experienced immense ecstasy and thought the world is a wonderful, interesting place. Then they woke up the next morning and thought, you know, what the hell did I mean by that? Back they were into the world, in a world which they felt to be basically boring. And they suddenly felt, you know, the moments of ecstasy are just illusions. The reality is this boring, solid matter stuck around us and which we can't wriggle our way out of. This is the reason you've got such a high rate of suicide, such a high rate of mental breakdown and so on. Now, this went on throughout the 19th century. At the beginning of the century, people were cheerful about it. W Wordsworth and Coleridge and Goethe and Schiller and Hoffman and so on were all, all sort of quite happy because in a sense, they did feel that you had these glimpses and that was very important. Before that, they really didn't have these glimpses very much. Um, as odd as it sounds, um, uh, the year 1780 was about the first time that people began to notice that nature was beautiful. Before that, they just thought of it as being a boring old lot of mountains and hills and all the rest of it. Dr. Johnson was bored stiff being taken around Scotland by Boswell. He you know, just felt there were too many hills and, and lakes and so on. <laughs> For the first time, 
when, with Wordsworth and, and Coleridge and Goethe, things really began to change. Then during the 19th century, what actually happened was from that sort of optimistic feeling that you get in Goethe, you, I mean, for example, you remember at the beginning of Faust, Goethe saying, and making Faust say, you know, I've studied philosophy and law and um, medicine and all the rest of it, and at the end of all this, I feel nevertheless that I can know nothing. And having got him, which incidentally was due to reading Kant, Kant actually caused several suicides by saying that the actual world, the world of phenomena, is all we can ever know. We can never know the reality. And if you're already in a pretty miserable state, Kant was the 19th century equivalent of Graham Greene. And, <laughs> and what actually happened during the 19th century was that the cheerfulness of Goethe, who had made Faust on the point of committing suicide, suddenly wake up when he heard the Easter bells everything flooded back, childhood and so on. You remember, he bursts into floods of tears and thinks, yeah, my God, no, life is absolutely wonderful. This sudden revelation that bursts in upon you and makes it clear that what you've done is trap yourself inside a world in your own head until it's become airless and suffocating. This, in a way, gave Goethe a sort of basic solution to the problem of Faust. But as the 19th century went on, the solution just seemed to trickle away until towards the end of the century, the poets um, of the 1890s, of what Yeats called the tragic generation, had this feeling that life is really a long, drawn-out defeat. Someone like Dowson writing, the fire is out and spent the warmth thereof, this is the end of every song man sings, and so on. This feeling that, you know, you can't win, this persisted right through into the 20th century, as Edmund Wilson pointed out in Axel's Castle, novelists of the 20th century like um, Proust and Joyce and um, Gertrude Stein and poets like T.S. Eliot and Paul Valéry were, in point of fact, heirs of that 19th century. The Waste Land is a sort of direct descendant of that feeling that you find in the poems of Ernest Dowson. And suddenly, in the mid-20th century, we found ourselves in this position expressed by someone like Albert Camus, who, as you know, was basically an existentialist, um, who said that life is completely absurd, meaningless. Sartre said, um, in being a nothingness, it is meaningless that we live and meaningless that we die. Man is a useless passion. Camus said in the myth of Sisyphus, you go to work, you come home, you go to work, you come home, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, until suddenly the why breaks in upon you and with that consciousness of the absurd, suddenly you begin to live. But what he meant was that you suddenly accept that life is absurd and meaningless, and this is the only way in which in some way you can reconcile yourself to it. Hemingway had said in The Old Man and the Sea, a man can be destroyed but not defeated. And this, in a way, was the attitude of Camus and Sartre and so on, a sort of stoical pessimism. And yet Sartre had seen at the beginning of the war a kind of answer, he said that when he was in the French resistance and likely to be arrested and shot at any moment, he never felt so free. Pointing a gun to your head, same thing. Suddenly, using a muscle which we have inside the brain, which clenches like that. We have a consciousness has a muscle. That's what it's all about. Now, this fascinated me so much because when I read those words of Hemingway, a man can be destroyed but not defeated, I suddenly realized with great clarity that I have no intention of being either defeated or destroyed. Somehow it must be possible to get beyond this. So this is what I set out to do, to try to create what you might call a new form of existentialism that was neither um, miserably defeatist nor even just stoical like Camus and Sartre's. This is what, in a sense, I've been trying to do ever since. And at a certain point, it struck me that I'd come across a very interesting key. And that key, in a sense, simply lies in the word imagination. Um, in the year 1740, a printer called Samuel Richardson was writing a volume called Familiar Letters, which was just a do-it-yourself book about how to write letters, letters written from prospective employees to their employers and so on and so forth. Um, he got so interested in writing this that he decided he would take one strand out of his book 
um, which was about a young girl writing letters to her mother, and turn it into a novel. And so he began to write a novel called Pamela. Now, in this novel, the young maidservant writes to her mother saying, my mistress has just died, but fortunately my young master said, don't you worry, Pamela, um, you will have a job with me and you can be my personal servant. And then she ends the letter saying, I'm a little worried. The young master just came into the room and just looked at me most peculiarly. And, <laughs> of course, the young master spends the rest of the novel trying to get her into bed. Uh, he actually sort of leaps out of cupboards and hurls her on beds. And <laughs> even at one stage, has the housekeeper hold her down while he tries to get a dress over her head. And luckily, <laughs> Pamela firmly resists, and at the end of the novel, the young master marries her. Now, this novel swept across Europe. It was the first bestseller. And you must also remember that, in a sense, it was the first novel. There had been some novels before that, you know, like Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travels and Don Quixote. But basically, um, they were about faraway places, you know, with strange-sounding names. This was about the girl next door. It was a soap opera. And people who read Pamela were able to get into the life of an ordinary servant girl and then take off on a magic carpet. People who felt bored and fed up with their own lives could suddenly go into somebody else's life and spend two days reading this vast novel because Pamela is nearly as big as War and Peace. And <laughs> spend days on this magic carpet floating away. But then, of course, you can see the problem. When they came back to the real world, they'd be, oh, my God. And this is why the romantics of the 19th century experience so much misery. They discover this wonderful drug that would carry them out of themselves, this magic carpet. But unfortunately, they could not reconcile themselves to the sheer brute force of reality when they landed back in it, you know, what William James calls stubborn, irreducible fact. This is what had them really worried. Now, nevertheless, Pamela caused a revolution. I mean, to begin with, it caused lending libraries. <laughs> libraries began to open to lend out Pamela. And, <laughs> And then Richardson went on to write another novel, Clarissa, in which the fantasy is carried right through and the unfortunate girl is actually raped in a brothel by the um, young rake and uh, she commits suicide and he dies in a duel. Um, people, of course, thought these were highly immoral novels because Richardson's attitude towards the rape was so moral, you know, this is a terrible and dreadful thing and we really don't want it to happen. But in point of fact, as an English critic B.S. Pritchett pointed out, there's a sort of feverish eroticism in the novels. He said, Richardson's like a man creeping across a room, a room towards a keyhole, be beckoning you on and getting you in a fever of expectation. <laughs> and you notice once again, if you're beckoning somebody and getting them into a fever of expectation, what you're doing is making them funnel their attention. That's what the novel taught people, to funnel the attention. It taught them to self-actualize to the extent of funneling. I'll wait until... Now, of course, lots of other people then went on to write novels, and almost immediately a man called John Cleland used this lesson to write a novel called Fanny Hill, which is entirely sexual fantasy, what Voltaire called books that one reads with one hand. And he was the... And Cleland, again, produced this fantasy of a servant girl going to London, accidentally getting herself into a brothel and thinking it's a normal lodging. And then, of course, the long description of all kinds of sort of sexual oddities, you know, including Pamela describing in detail losing her virginity and so on. Now, the English government was so shocked by this, they saw it as such a threat to the Constitution that they offered Cleland a life pension on condition he would write no other novels, like, <laughs> like Fanny Hill. And... Um, in fact, he didn't. He lived very comfortably for the rest of his life on a government pension. <laughs> but the interesting thing was, Cleland had suddenly realized what Richardson was all about. And this was only eight years after Pamela came out. And in the same year that Pamela came out, there was a man called the Marquis de Sade who was born. And he was the person who really carried this to an extreme. He thought if you can generate this kind of mental intensity by focusing all your attention upon sex, and raise yourself, so to speak, to this higher level of intensity, then surely, and in a certain sense, we recognize Sard as a quite serious thinker. 
we recognize that what he was saying was an interesting possibility. Um, raise consciousness by total focus, feverish focus upon sex, and suddenly you ought to be able to achieve a higher level of consciousness than normal. And this, in a sense, was the basic philosophy of Saad's novels. Um, the point Saad was missing was that as soon as you begin to focus to that extent, you become subject to the law of diminishing returns. What Saad was forced to do was to make his novels increasingly violent and so on. So again, by the way, a very interesting problem. It still puzzles me a great deal about um, serial killers. For some reason, once they've got into this business of rape and sex, uh, the uh, cruelty follows almost automatically. I was get, being given a lift to the station once by a taxi driver um, uh, talking about the Yorkshire Ripper, who uh, the book had just appeared about him. And the taxi driver said, yes, I used to work in a slaughterhouse. He said, but I gave it up and drove a taxi instead. And I said, why? And he said, um, because I found myself beginning to enjoy it. Very strange. It's a thing I don't understand. But anyway, this, 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 this is one of the mechanisms of the human mind. Now, um, this recognition that sex can actually produce this kind of feverish intensity is extremely interesting. Uh, what Saad did not realize, and what serial killers don't realize, is the sexual elevator doesn't go all the way up to the roof. It just goes halfway and then stops. And if you want to get the rest of the way, you have to get up and walk or take another elevator. Now, what I'm trying to say, though, is this. What happened to Graham Greene when he pointed the gun at his head was this sudden feeling, oh, my God, and then the relaxation. Now, it ought to be possible, in theory, to do that by the use of imagination. This is what Richardson had really set rolling, this ball of imagination. You see, you think of it. If you'd been born in 1700, you would not believe the sheer boredom of life, particularly if you were in an American or an English country village. I mean, you know, read the Scarlet Letter. Absolutely nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> and the most important and interesting event of the week was going to church and hearing the sermon. And for the first time, you kind of relaxed. You were told a story. And you left church feeling as if you'd been on a magic carpet. And so volumes of sermons were the great bestsellers of the 18th century. And then, of course, when the novel came out, sermons just suddenly disappeared completely from the bookshelves because Samuel Richardson had taught people a new way of accessing the magic carpet. Now, this fascinated me because I could see I was beginning to, to get together a web that began to give me some answers, some practical answers, not just like the pen trick, but the kind of answers you suddenly see when things begin to weave themselves together properly and you begin to get the beginning of what is called the Eureka experience. Uh, for example, you can see that when Wilder Penfield touched the temporal cortex with his electric probe and suddenly caused this tremendous flood of memories, all he had done was what Marcel Proust tried to do in his enormous novel, Remembrance of Things Past. You remember that at the beginning of the novel, Marcel comes home feeling rather tired and miserable, um, his mother hands him a little cake called a madeleine and a cup of herb tea. And as Marcel tastes the madeleine dipped in the herb tea, he suddenly experiences a strange feeling of ecstasy. He says, I had ceased to feel mediocre, accidental, mortal. And he takes another taste, trying to remember why he experiences this blissful ecstasy that suddenly destroys all of the feeling of misery and exhaustion as the second stream always does. And suddenly remembers that when he was a child, a child in a little village called Combray, his Aunt Leonie used to give him a bit of her madeleine dipped in her tea when he came back from his Sunday afternoon walk. And that this has suddenly been brought back with tremendous intensity. And that it's because he suddenly, so to speak, short-circuited time. When you are stuck in the present and you're tired, you feel that you are a victim of the present moment. You feel what Sartre calls contingent, um, absolutely excuse me, dependent upon the present moment. In that moment, suddenly, your mind rise, rises above time and also you experience a curious sense of inner control and certainty. Now, thinking about this business of Proust made me realize that we're talking almost about a different faculty. When you focus in a particular way, 
you go into a kind of peak experience which seems to eliminate time. I called it Faculty X. The name came to me one day, a snowy day in Washington in the 1960s, when I was suddenly pinning, trying to pin this down. What actually happens in these curious moments of sheer happiness? Proust, as you know, wrote this enormous 12-volume novel in an attempt to um, focus other moments of Faculty X. He thought the, the answer to getting it back again, which is what he wanted to do, was to focus on his own past and try to revive it simply by um, remembering it in, in immense detail. And of course, as Maslow could have told him, it doesn't work. Actually, he gets about, as you know, half a dozen experiences of Faculty X throughout the book. And the last one towards the end of the last volume, Time Remembered. But in a sense, he had not solved the problem. And what's more, locking himself into this soundless room in Paris in which he wrote the book, in a sense, he launched himself into this uh, business of feeling pointless, meaningless, until, you know, he died sort of relatively young, much younger than he should. And so Proust, in a sense, had not only taken the wrong route, I mean, he'd taken a totally destructive route. Of course, if he'd met Wilder Penfield, he would have found a far easier access to the memories of a child, and we, we wouldn't have a masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> now, this faculty X business is clearly the answer in a basic way. We have another faculty which we do not normally use. You see, Chesterton once said, we say thank you when someone passes us the salt, but we don't mean it. We say the earth is round, but we don't mean it. But Ed Mitchell meant it because he could see it was round from space. It's this faculty for being able to say something and mean it and know it's true. Now, Arnold Toynbee described how he came to write his huge volume, The Study of History. What happened, he said, was that he'd been climbing Mount Tagetus in Greece to the ruined citadel of Mystra, which had been destroyed by the Turks in the same war that um, Byron was engaged in. And he said he'd, he was sitting there on a broken wall, chewing a bar of chocolate, feeling quite relaxed after the climb, and that's very important, the relaxation, looking out over the plain of Sparta, when he said suddenly it hit him with tremendous force more than a century ago, the Turks came over that broken wall there, poured into Mistra, and ever since then, Mistra has been a ruin. And he said it hit him with such violence that he could see the Turks coming over the wall. Faculty X. And in the tenth volume of the study of history, he describes ten different occasions on which this has happened, when in a certain place, history has become so totally alive that he was in two places at once. That's the interesting point, two places at once. And in one of them, walking past Victoria Station, he said, and being aware, fully aware of the wall going past on his left-hand side, he suddenly became aware of all history in one single flash, as some enormous flowing river and of his own life as one rivulet, a tiny little wave on the river. Now, what's interesting is he said he was aware of the wall of the station. He didn't go off into some internal world. He was in two streams at the same time. Now, I was always fascinated by this question about the two sides of the brain, the left and right side of the brain, um, which I, I discovered fairly late on. You know, to briefly summarize, you know that if you take off the top of your head, it looks a bit like a walnut, and that it's joined in the middle by a bridge called the corpus callosum and that they discovered that if they sliced the corpus callosum, they could actually stop epileptic attacks, stop the electrical storm getting from one side of the brain to the other. But it appeared to make no difference whatsoever to the patient. Now, what they had always known since the 19th century is that the two halves of the brain have totally different functions. The left half appears to deal with language, logic, coping, in other words, with our everyday problems. And the right half appears to deal with sort of, <laughs> we know pattern recognition, but you might say art. Um, religion, music, all these other things. In other words, you've got a scientist living in the left and an artist living in the right. Now, the interesting thing was that the first thing they noticed when they sliced the brain was that it appeared to make no difference whatsoever to the patient. In other words, they couldn't see why the corpus callosum existed at all. Somebody suggested it might be stop the brain sagging in the middle. Now, <laughs> in fact, what they did suddenly begin to notice was that if a patient banged into something with his left side, he didn't notice that he'd banged into a table. Then gradually they came to realize that, in fact, what they'd done is to sever two people living in your head from one another. 
that you have two pe people living in these hemispheres and that the per person you call you lives in the left. And there, a few centimeters away, lives a total stranger. The odd thing is that the person called you is the scientist and the, who's now, let's say, listening to me and taking in what I'm saying, whereas the artist is the person who lives on the other side. Mozart said that symphonies were always walking into his head fully fledged and all he had to do was to write them down. Where did they come from? His right brain. Who wrote them down? His left brain. Now, if Mozart was a split-brain patient, so are the rest of us. We're all split-brain patients and you've got two people living inside your heads. And one of them is a total stranger. And this total stranger is the artist, or the one who deals with religion, with music, the one who experiences music, and so on. Now, this suddenly seemed to me to answer an extremely interesting question. When we are experiencing these curious states of happiness, you have a feeling of being in two places at the same time. And for example, a child sitting in a room at Christmas listening to the snow pattering on the windows while he's sitting in front of a warm fire. He's in two places at once. He's there in the warm room, but he's also out there in the snow, and that's why he's so happy. He's in two places at the same time. You get out of the water on a, co on a beach in summer and go and lie down in the sun on a towel. You've never felt so sort of relaxed and happy as the sun begins to soak into your body. Why? Because part of you is still out there in the cold sea, and the other half is here on the warm beach, two places at once. I call it duo-consciousness. When you're bored and you're just stuck in one place, that's mono-consciousness. When you're in two places at once like that, that's duo-consciousness. And the only times we are really happy are when we are in duo-consciousness. So, it suddenly struck me when I was thinking about, well, why the hell do we have two halves of the brain the answer is so we can be in two places at once. That's what actually happens when you get into these curious states of aliveness and awakeness. The two halves of the brain just somehow come together. You see, when we were kids, we used to play a kind of game in which you stood like this stiff and then you let yourself fall backwards into the arms of someone behind you who was waiting to catch you. And, of course, you didn't really dare to fall half the time because you thought they were going to stand back and let you fall on your back. Now, the point is, the right brain will never let you fall. It will always catch you provided you know that it's really there. I once compared these two to Stan and Ollie um, in the um, old films Laurel and Hardy and created what I call the Laurel and Hardy theory of consciousness, which is basically that the you who lives in your left brain is like Ollie. He's the kind of one who's in charge. The person who lives in your right brain, the non-dominant hemisphere it's called, is Stan. And Stan may be pretty stupid in some ways, but he is in charge of your energy supply. So, you wake up on a rotten, rainy morning, you think, oh God, Monday and it's raining. Ollie says that. Stan overhears him, and Stan always exaggerates. He says, oh God, Monday and it's raining, and doesn't send you up any energy. And then, you know, everything goes wrong. You sort of knock a coffee over the table, you trip over the doorstep, you miss your bus, and you think, oh God, it's just one of those days. And Stan overhears and says, oh God, it's just one of those days. And once again, you're in this negative feedback state. Now, on the other hand, think of a child on Christmas morning. He wakes up and says, Marvellous, it's Christmas. And Stan over here and says, Marvellous, it's Christmas! And sends up a flood of energy, the peak experience. And all through the day, everything. You know, the mince pies, the cooking, the, the Christmas carols, the Christmas tree with its lights. Everything reinforces this feeling of marvellous, it's Christmas. And each time, Stan sends up a little flood of energy. And by the end of the day, you're in a sort of glowing state in which the world is self-evidently good. An almost visionary state. Now, this is extremely interesting because what is actually happening is that a kind of game of tennis is developing between Stan and Ollie. See, when I started writing, I'd, I would sort of pour out some ideas on paper and I'd think, my God, that's a masterpiece. And then I'd look at it the next morning and, ugh, it was a complete mess. It was like a lot of flies squashed all over the paper. <laughs> and you had the feeling that this was inevitable because inspiration... Um, is, in a sense, an illusion, and the words won't catch it. It simply leaks out of the cracks in the words. But, you know, you persist, because, you know, if you're a writer, you do. It's the only thing you can do. And one morning, you wake up, and it's still there. It's been caught. It's there on the paper. And then you get quite interested, because suddenly, when you're working, you know you're doing it well. You know that your verbal faculty is catching those insights as they come from the other side and getting them down on the paper. And what's more, Stan is delighted... 
you catch the insight he tosses at you like a tennis ball and you get it down on the paper and Stan says, yes, yes, that's what I meant, marvellous. And suddenly you do it a lot better. You say, oh, good, thank you very much. And suddenly this wonderful tennis match begins to occur between the two of us. You are aware of Stan's existence. That's what it's all about. When we're in these states, we become aware of Stan's existence. And that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about in human evolution. And the first stage in becoming aware of Stan's existence is to know he exists. Know it consciously, and you start to do it. Uh, how, how much longer am I allowed to go on for? <laughs> All right. I know, five more minutes. Uh, now... What I find so interesting about all this is that you can see that the whole thing is beginning to fall into a structure. Once you know that Stan exists, you've taken the first major step in this direction. To know that Stan exists makes an enormous difference. I'll give you an example. Um, a film director I know, a uh, producer I know, periodically pays me a lot of money to go to London and to um, fiddle around with some absolutely shitty script that nobody else will touch. And he sh stuffs me in a hotel in Park Lane, allows me to order whatever I like, but during that week, I have to turn out this mess. Well, last time he did this, um, I, he gave me the, one of the worst scripts I've ever seen. And I said, but Dino, who is the murderer? And he said, hi, you tell me. <laughs> and and uh, when I was four days into this script, you know, doing a fairly good job, really, it was hard work. I thought, God, I'm just never going to do it in the time. I went to bed, and suddenly you get that feeling of despair. And God, I, I just can't go through with it. I've got to confess I've been beaten. I went to bed, and suddenly I began thinking about what I've just been saying to you about Stan and Ollie. And as soon as I began to think about this, I suddenly began to think, you know, Stan will always catch you. And as soon as I thought this... I suddenly began to experience that feeling that, you know, you could get when you're praying as a child and suddenly you feel okay. And I went off to sleep. And I woke up the next morning about 7 o'clock, feeling absolutely fine. Suddenly some ideas came into my head. I began to write and typed away busily all day. And towards 5 o'clock, Dino's secretary came along to collect the stuff to translate into Italian. And I said, just as she walked into the room, I finished the last sentence. There couldn't have been a better sort of synchronicity. And as... Dino rang me and said, is there anything you want? And I said, you know, just let me go home. <laughs> and as I drove, went in his huge private limousine to Paddington Station, I sort of said, thank you, old right brain. <laughs> <laughs> the recognition that is really there. Now, um, what I'm going to say in my last two and a half minutes is, um, when I was driving up from Esalen once, um, up to um, San Francisco, I found, just for the fun of it, trying to... Um, work out how many modes of consciousness I could identify. And I suddenly thought, well, um, obviously when you're fast asleep or dead, you've got no consciousness, so that's level naught. In that case, level one's obviously dreams, and, you know, we can toss in hypnagogic experiences on the edge of sleep and so on. Um, that's level one. And so level two, level two is merely being conscious, opening your eyes, um, very often, let's say, a child being carried home by his father from a party, so tired that he's incapable of really grasping anything, but he just sees people going past. That's the second level of consciousness. There's no you. So what's the third level? Well, the third level is what Sartre called nausea and Camus the absurd. That is to say, Sartre suddenly felt the net that brute reality was overwhelming. Do you remember the main scene in Nausea? He looks at the root of a tree sitting in the park and suddenly experiences a terrible inner collapse with the feeling this tree is sort of like a, a twisting octopus, that he exists with such intensity that it completely negates his own existence. Um, that nausea is level three. So what's level four? Well, level four is our ordinary everyday consciousness that we are now experiencing. And What's more, in the lower levels of level four, you still find it pretty hard work. You, you know, Emily Bronte began a poem, does the road wind uphill all the way right to the very end? <laughs> and when you're feeling low and tired, you get this feeling right to the very end. Then, you know, about halfway up our normal everyday consciousness, you get that feeling that you're winning. That, you know, sort of seven down, two still to go kind of feeling. And suddenly, you begin to feel cheerful. And from then on, you suddenly get this odd experience, and this is Maslow's Peakers. Um, you feel, you know, more or less in charge of your life. It no longer worries you too much. You feel that with enough effort, enough concentration, you can really do something. And the effort and concentration is really important, incidentally. 
I was reading the other day about um, a Russian um, film producer called Boris Yarmolinsky, um, who can actually hold a cigarette packet between his palms like that, and he parts his hands very cautiously, and the cigarette packet remains hanging in space. And asked how he d did, does this, he says, well, I put something of myself into the cigarette packet, and then I persuade it to stay where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as if the cigarette packet is a little animal. You know, it's what Peter was saying. All consciousness uh, exists in matter as well as everything else. Now, what I'm saying is that at the top end of level four, which is our ordinary everyday level, there's the spot gap up to the next level, the peak experience. And the next level, level five, is what I call spring morning consciousness. That sudden bubbly feeling you have on spring mornings that everything's self-evidently wonderful. And that provided you put enough effort into life, everything's going to remain wonderful. Now, in that case, what's level six? I suddenly saw that level six is, in fact, um, the level in which you experience spring morning consciousness, but a kind of continuity of it. You know, spring morning consciousness maybe lasts for five, ten minutes or an hour, but not longer. Think of a young couple on honeymoon on the balcony of a hotel looking out over a lake with mountains in the distance and with music coming from down below, ecstatically happy and knowing that their happiness is going to last for the next two weeks. This is what J.B. Priestley called magic. Magic consciousness is level six. So what's level seven? Level seven is what I've been saying earlier, faculty X. And faculty X is the intensest kind of consciousness. I, found, I thought, is there a level eight? Yes, I suppose there is. But this is mystical consciousness, and unfortunately I haven't had time to talk about this. Uspensky gives the best account of it in a chapter of a new model of the universe called Experimental Mysticism which really goes into the details of this. But one of the things about mystical consciousness is this weird feeling they get that the inside is the outside and the outside is the inside and the man is God and God is man and the subjective is the object, and, and etc. It's, it's meaningless for our ordinary conscious purposes. So let's say that our ordinary human consciousness has seven levels. And the interesting thing is that this level we were talking about, when suddenly you begin to feel good I'm winning, is exactly halfway up level four. In other words, it's level three and a half. It's like going up a mountain, and when you get to the top, suddenly it's all easier going down the other side. Human beings at this moment are at the top of the mountain. And as soon as we know this, and as soon as we experience the optimism to really know what we can do, you see, think about the, what I was saying about the robot. Normally, you could say that in your ordinary state of consciousness, you are 50% robot and 50% what you might call real you. And, you know, this is a perfectly agreeable state, because the robot does a lot of things for you. Now, when you're suddenly feeling very cheerful, you go up to 51% real you and only 49% robot. And when you're really happy, spring morning consciousness, you're probably something like 55% real you and only 45% robot. On the other hand, when you're feeling low and miserable, you go to, down to 49% real you and 51% robot. And if you get into states like nervous breakdown, you go down to 45% real you. And it's incredibly difficult to get back, as Margaret Lane found out. It's such hard work getting back to normal you. What I'm trying to say, though, is there's just 1% difference between being 50-50, in which case, you know, you're in normal consciousness, and suddenly being 51% real you and 49% robot. All we human beings have to do is to grasp what I'm saying, to grasp that we've reached this particular point in evolution, that we're already there in a fundamental sense, if we could become normally 51% real you and 49% robot, we've cracked it. From then on, it's all, as it were, easy. I've got to shut up, haven't I? <laughs> Hello. I just was interested if you see any particular um, service part of this philosophy. Surface. Ser service to be of oh. service to um, to the world. In other words, the caritas part. The 
outreaching, it seems that peak experiences are wonderful to experience, but how to carry that out to be of some um, altruistic use in the world? Oh, no, I mean, this in a sense, I mean, it's fairly straightforward. Don't forget, as I say, Maslow's peakers were all people um, who were able to handle their own lives and, as it were, help other people. The, um, and this is, in a sense, quite automatic. We have the need to pour out energy. Um, we have the need um, for, you know, what might be called the flow experience. Human beings are like rivers. And if life gets terribly slow, the river begins to get all twisted and silted up. What we then want is a flash flood to come down and clear away all the silt and make the river straight again. Uh, serial killers, incidentally, do this by sex murder. But for the rest of us, we need something into which we can put deep conviction into what Holly Granville Barker calls the secret life. Now, the interesting thing is that the secret life does not have to be some higher religious aspiration or something of the sort. The secret life, in fact, is anything in which you put total energy and enthusiasm. Putting a ship in a bottle will do. Now, obviously, um, for those um, who like other people enormously, then one of the simplest ways of actually causing the flow experience is through other people. What you are doing is allowing the flow to go into other people. Um, I must confess, I'm not terribly good at it, because I'm being naturally the sort of person who works. I'm a workaholic. I, I work literally every day of the year, including you know Christmas Day and Boxing Day and New Year's Day. And if I don't work, you know, I, I, I don't still feel, feel very good about it. I feel as if I haven't had sufficient exercise. The result is that working away obsessively and inside my own head, my main problem um, is to stop myself getting into this sort of suffocating condition of being stuck in a small room. And this I've got quite good and efficient at. But when I'm forced to do something, um, I, d I don't lecture in England at all. I just never appear on the lecture platform there. Um, America's almost the only place where I do lecture. And when I come to America, I very often find that what has happened, you know, somewhere like Esalen, where I get there and I discover they give me 18 hours in a weekend from Friday evening to Sunday afternoon. So three hours, you know, Friday evening, th three or four hours, uh, five hours and so on, right through. And this is really pretty exhausting. What I find is that I can do this provided I'm relating sufficiently deeply to the other people in the audience. And what's more, on one occasion, the last time I went to Esalen, um, I'd unfortunately caught a cold at, in the Omegar Institute. And I was feeling absolutely filthy. And after giving a long afternoon lecture on Saturday afternoon with a Saturday evening session still to do, I went off to the room. My wife went out for dinner with somebody, leaving me there. And I lay down on the bed, closed my eyes, and woke up and realized that my class should have started half an hour ago. I staggered to my feet, staggered along to the classroom, opened my mouth to speak, and I got no voice. No voice whatsoever. I croaked like this. I got water and swigged it down. It made no difference. Then one of the men in the class, one of the nicest men I've ever come across, his name was Jones, um, said to the rest of the class, OK, let's see if we can cure Colin. And I sat there quietly in my chair, and they all stared at me intently in total silence for five minutes. And then suddenly I felt fine. <laughs> it all came back, my voice and everything else. They did it. Now, clearly, human beings have this ability for a telepathic interaction, which is even more important than their normal social interaction. And it's when we get into this telepathic interaction that we're really getting into the future. You, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but um, I guess it's okay because you wrote about it. Um, uh, your own suicide um, experience and what the insight was that sort of stayed with you pretty much and so I suppose changed your life in terms of, you know, towards being an optimist. Yes, it was an interesting breakthrough experience. Uh, <laughs> Marilyn Ferguson once said to me that... Um, it's only people who have actually thought of blowing their brains out who have really broken through in, into a new dimension. And I, I, I can see what she means. What happened was briefly this. In my teens, uh, I was working as a lab assistant in my old school, but I didn't want to 
because in the time since I left school and taken some more exams and then gone back to school as a lab assistant, I got very interested in poetry and in literature, and I wanted to become a writer. Also, I found, you know, adolescence and all these problems terribly exhausting. And one, I discovered that the best way to get this out of my system was to write it down on paper in a diary. You remember that words within the Intimations of Immortality Ode starts off feeling utterly miserable, saying, you know, it is not now as it hath been of yore, go er, wheresoever I may, by night or day, the things I've seen I now can see no more. And then at the end of the poem, having discussed this at great length, says quite cheerfully, um, to me alone there came a thought of grief, a timely utterance gave that thought relief, and I again am strong. And I'd suddenly discovered this trick that you'll make yourself strong, by pouring words down on paper, by pouring out your frustrations. This is, by the way, something I'd recommend to everybody who wants to be a writer. Keep a journal. And, uh, but on this particular day, I'd got home so absolutely fed up and miserable that I sat there pouring out the words into the journal until I felt strong all right. And the strength made me think, you know, bugger it. I'm fed up with God. The bastard isn't giving me a chance. <laughs> He keeps driving me forward, and then just as I begin to feel optimistic, suddenly he lets me down, and I get this feeling that, you know, life is meaningless once again. I thought, you know, he's a kind of parasite whose business is to get me optimistic and then steal the energy. I later wrote a book called The Mind Parasites, based upon the same idea. Anyway, I suddenly thought, I'll screw him up, I'll kill myself. And I went off, cycled off to uh, my night school, um, feeling tremendously strong, quite determined that I would do it. Um, I got to night school. Um, I was late, and there was a group gathered around the teacher at the, his desk. I went across to the reagent shelves and <laughs> took down a bottle of potassium cyanide, uncorked the bottle, and I could smell the sort of bitter almond smell. I knew exactly what would happen, that the potassium cyanide combines with the hydrochloric acid in your stomach to form hydrocyanic acid, which just burns straight through the pit of your stomach. And as I was raising this thing to my lips to drink, I suddenly had a curious experience. I turned into two people. One of them was this idiot Colin Wilson who was standing there with this thing in his hand about to drink poison, and another one was me. And I didn't give a damn whether he drank poison or not. He seemed such a bloody idiot, I couldn't care less. But unfortunately, if he killed himself, he'd kill me too. And as soon as I saw this, I caught the cyanide back, put it on the shelf, and went over to the teacher's desk with an enormous feeling of happiness, obviously very like green with the Russian roulette. But in this case, it lasted two or three days, and having seen this once with great clarity... I realized that in point of fact, provided you do screw your will up to a certain intensity until it hurts, you go into the breakthrough experience. This, I suppose, has meant all this emphasis of mine upon will and concentration. It's one type of mysticism. This, for example, is why I detest Buddhism with all of its notion, you know, the world is a lousy place and what you've got to do is to discipline yourself enough not to enjoy it and, you know, to pull back, not to let the world uh, to grip you like, you know, burrs gripping your clothes when you're walking through a wood. <laughs> but it seems to me that that's a negative sort of attitude. All my Buddhist friends assure me I'm totally wrong about this. But that real mysticism is based upon these curious moments of sheer absolute happiness. The one I love um, recording is the one about Nietzsche who in his teens made the mistake of reading Schopenhauer when he was already in a state of depression and, <laughs> went up and went out to climb a hill called Leutsch and suddenly a storm began to brew and he quickly took shelter as the first drops fell inside a hut in the top of the hill. And it turned out that there was a shepherd in the hut um, killing baby goats. And Nietzsche would normally have been horrified by this. But he said, as the storm broke with a tremendous crash... And the rain thundered down on the roof, and the thunder rolled, and the lightning flashed, and the smell of blood, and the cries of the kids all mingled together into one experience of overwhelming affirmation and ecstasy. And he wrote later, will, pure will, without the troubles and perplexities of intellect, how happy, how free. Now this seems to me to be the typical Western form of the peak experience in which suddenly we are reconciled to absolutely everything, in which everything seems superb, but above all, your own energy seems so enormous that you feel you can not only take control of your own life, but, you know, take control of the lives of everybody you know. <laughs> Hi. Oh, um, sorry, there's somebody down here first. You were... Uh, 
mentioned Mr. Green and his Russian roulette several times. And this, um, I think you said, consciousness has a muscle. Um, and I started making this connection between uh, the prospect of accepting death, um, which is also in Buddhist teaching, um, that you begin to see the real meaning of life. Um, is that what you're saying, or is there, is there a connection there? Yeah, there's a connection, certainly. And the connection really is in someone like Heidegger, I think, rather than in Buddhism. Um, Heidegger declaring that it's in the face of death that we suddenly grasp the meaning of life completely, as, as in the Graham Greene experience. You know, Heidegger talks about it as being authentic existence, as apart from the sort of chattering, inauthentic existence that people normally uh, tend to live in society. Uh, th this seems to me extremely important, but the only pr uh, problem with this is that Heidegger then developed it in entirely the wrong direction. You see, Heidegger um, was a pupil of Edmund Husserl, who still seems to me the greatest philosopher since Plato. And we were, Peter was saying earlier about David Hume looking inside himself and not finding the real David Hume, just finding a lot of ideas and impressions blowing around like leaves in the wind. Now, all of Western psychology from then on had this feeling that you've got nobody inside you, there's no real self, that you are triggered by the outside world like a penny in the slot machine. Now, Husserl noticed something extremely interesting, that in fact all perception is intentional. It's like an archer firing an arrow at a target. If you look at your watch without really bothering to pay attention, you don't see the time. You have to look at it a second time, a few seconds later. To, and this time you have to fire your attention at the watch like an archer. Now, the point is that if perception is an arrow, there must be an archer. You may not be able to see him when you look inside yourself, but there must be an archer, all right, which is so-called the transcendental ego. And so Husserl suggested making philosophy... Um, the notion that, first of all, we should try to look at things completely objectively. You, you should try to see your feelings and all the rest as coldly and objectively as a scientist sees something on a microscope slide. This is what he calls the epoch, eh? And secondly, that we must recognize that all perception is intentional. Along came Heidegger with these ideas of his about death and so on, facing death, authentic existence. But then immediately transferred the whole thing into the pessimistic mode. We are stuck in life whether we like it or not. And of course it was Heidegger who went on to influence Sartre into saying man is a useless passion. And so after this sort of supreme peak of Husserl, quite suddenly we've descended once again into these sort of lowlands of Sartre and Camus and then later worse still Derrida and Foucault and all of the postmodern movement. What's happened, you see? We've been in, in a continual decline of pessimism for something like 250 years, and now for the first time we have a real chance of pulling out of it because we can see the answer. The thing is that these idiot French appear to be incapable of thinking logically. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me that when you were beginning talking about focusing the attention, 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 that in a way, and then you arrive at the, this, these moments of peak experiences, which I'm sure many of us have had. If you're an artist, and I know there are many artists here, you can get very focused in that, or any number of things. Actually, what it could also be described as is a form of escapism. To use, I mean, and in which case, what are you escaping from and what's optimistic about it? I mean, fundamentally then, if escape is so joyful, you're also accepting the fact that you're escaping from something which isn't joyful, and that's the other reality. So that it's fine to be an optimist in a sense, but underneath it is also the, the other side. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. The second question I wanted, that wasn't a question, I did the wrong thing, didn't I? I was supposed to say that here. But my other, the, the question I wanted to ask you was the role of the physical versus the um, emotional or psychological in how anybody feels at any time. Very often, how would you, you haven't brought that side of it up. I, I was just curious to know how you felt about that. You know, it, it does seem to me, in a sense, that what you ask overemphasizes the role of the physical in all this. Certainly, the physical um, plays an important part. And the first part of the question um, emphasizes that. Uh, in fact, what you've done is to ask a question which I always get and which I was waiting to hear. And that um, question is basically, if we had too many peak experiences, wouldn't they turn into a plateau experience and cease to be a peak experience? And um, 
And the, the same kind of thing goes with this notion of isn't the peak experience a kind of escape from something, in which case, what are you escaping? In point of fact, obviously, the peak experience um, is not an escape in a basic sense because what it actually does is strengthens you to go back, to, so to speak, to changing your life and the world. So far from being an escape, it's actually a funneling back into real life. And the same thing goes about the question of the plateau experience. Um, that is to say, when you experience a feeling of intensity, uh, you are, in fact, capable of experiencing uh, a recognition that this is freedom. The sudden notion that you are free is of tremendous importance. Um, a school child doesn't have very much ability to handle freedom. A long holiday gets it all bored and fed up and almost glad to go back to school. And yet we can handle far more freedom than a child. And what's more, we don't get bored and fed up with it. Or at least we need an enormous amount more to get bored and fed up with it. We are able to handle more and more and more freedom. So far from being an escape, the peak experience is trying to teach us to handle more and more and more freedom. You see, this question of freedom is of terrific importance. It hits you like a bomb. It's a breakthrough to objective reality. A, a friend of mine at the college where I taught, um, her husband was being unfaithful to her all the time, and she was suddenly feeling so miserable that she thought she would leave him. And her brother said, oh, yeah, well, I'm taking a job in Ohio. Why don't you come along and be my housekeeper? And at this point, her husband repented and said, oh, for God's sake, I'm going to take a job in Oregon anyway. Come with me. And she said she was feeling for days, agony. God, what shall I do, Oregon or Ohio? Oregon or Ohio? She said, and then suddenly it hit her in the middle of the night. I don't have to go to Oregon or Ohio. I'm free. And she said, it was a revelation. She said, even her tennis improved. And <laughs> now, you can see that far from being an escapist experience, the experience of freedom is actually a recognition of something we do not normally recognize. Time for one more bot? I'd love to, a chance to hear you uh, talk about any gender differences, if there could possibly be a Stan and Mary, or... <laughs> um, it seemed like the, the Stan was always the more visible, and the, and the other was less, and I'm wondering if you've ever kind of turned around and looked at the, the other one. I, I'm just curious if that's in there. Uh, yes, uh, well, as you know, most um, psychologists who were talking about the right and left brain to begin with Always compared the ref left brain to the the left brain to the male and the right brain to the female, the dominant and non-dominant hemispheres. Now, um, what I found very interesting about this is that what it's implying is, in fact, is that um, the right brain, the female, tends to be sort of rather like a quiet little housewife who never dares to contradict her husband. Now, the problem is that if you get into this state, then uh, you never evolve in any sense at all. What tends to happen is that if, for example, you're an artist, um, like the lady who says uh, she's a painter, you little by little release this quiet, frightened little housewife into self-expression, into expansion. Uh, when I was in uh, Finland, a man called Brad Absets showed me some poems which struck me as exceptionally good, and he said, you know, they wrote themselves, and I knew exactly what he meant, but he wasn't talking figuratively. And I said, how? What happened? And he then told me these curious experiences that at a time of intense mental distress and misery, he'd been lying there on a bed after skiing, when suddenly his left leg, which had ached like mad after the first skiing of the year, had wanted to rise up in the air. So very curious, he lay there and watched it, wondered what it was up to. He did this several times, did this, the other leg did this several times. And then suddenly he felt absolutely fine. The next day when he was standing in the dining hall where the food was all laid out for you to help yourself from tables, quite suddenly um, he felt his left hand doing this. I thought, uh-uh, here we go again. <laughs> and uh, he let the left hand do what it wanted and he went out and took so certain foods which he did not normally eat. And every day this happened, it took food and he found himself feeling much better. But some days it didn't take any food. And he was curious enough, he was ravenously hungry, and he would sit there at the table, and others would say, aren't you hungry today? He'd say, no, no, and think, looking, scowling at his left hand. <laughs> and, but he said, this went on for ages, and then one day, his little daughter handed him her crayons and a, and a writing pad to draw him a picture, and suddenly the hand started doing this again. And by this time, he'd found that he could do this with both hands equally well. 
And he found suddenly he was making these incredible drawings, which he showed me. They all looked a little like psychedelic drawings and the most incredible and beautiful patterns, and not one of them was anything like any other. You'd think that you couldn't do very much with curves and circles and colours, but every one was absolutely, totally distinct. Now... Brad then went on to do all kinds of things. He kept bees and found that he didn't need a mask or anything, that when he put himself into this state, the bees settled all over him and he was never stung. Obviously, what he'd done was to allow, allow the non-dominant hemisphere to suddenly begin expressing itself. And once it had really begun to express itself, it was allowed to work in total partnership with the dominant hemisphere, and suddenly he changed into a totally different type of person. Now, again, this seems to me to be a model of what we're talking about in the future. The only thing is that women have to learn to do this too.